presentation, I wasn't entirely sure of what to bring. There were so many possibilities, but most of all this is tank and I wanted to bring something we were able to discuss. So I hope I won't be too chaotic or too fast because I tend to do those things. But my presentation will be about world building. And I would like to start by exploring the relationship between archaeology and literature in this scope. Now, I say in this scope because every reader knows of the power of literature. And I think every archaeologist does too, at least since Schliemann discovered the Troy by reading the Iliad. I think that's <laughs> And archaeology has a vast literature on the role of narrative in the consumption, creation, and communication of meaning. There were several archaeologists that have also written novels. But now, what about world building? How can literature serve us as archaeologists? Uh, well, archaeology is always provisional, it is always subjective, it is always partial. We know that. And the more approaches, the more sources, the greater the accuracy. That is also true. So, I think that archaeology and literature can complement the, the gaps of each other and give us a greater accuracy about the past and more holistic and accurate study. So I can think of three key aspects that literature gives archaeology. The first one has to do with precision. Now text, like speech and, uh, and like material culture, has something that material, material culture doesn't have. It can produce meaning effect. So it can give us um, a precise message about a certain state of mind and it is also less ambiguous. So I think the first way that literature can contribute to archaeology is by giving it a greater precision. Now, secondly, it gives us easier, easier access to mindsets, behaviors, and identities. And thirdly, it is the intelligible expression of a relational ontology. And I will get back to this later. Now, for a bonus one. And this won't be the focus of the presentation, but I thought I should include it nonetheless. Um, I have ideas. Now, more recently there have been discussions about the rule of these fictional worlds in archaeology, how they can be used as an interesting part of research and communication among archaeologists. So how can these words give us new ideas and advance archaeological useful possibilities? And I give you an example, James Michener, The Source. Now, this book is a narrative that shifts between the excavation of a fictional Tel Makor in the 1960s and the present that the archaeologists and the past that the archaeologists are uncovering. And Mich Michner does this by showing us the artifacts as, and buildings as they are being used and deposited and then as they are being excavated and interpreted. Now, Michner drew from archaeological sources, but he wasn't limited by them. And his fictional accounts of domestication went again monocausal and theological explanation, and instead proposed the co-evolution of domestication, religious ideas and settlement, as people thought, experienced, tried, made mistakes, learned, and then passed on that knowledge. So this is closer to 21st century thinking than to anything written in the mid to late 20th century. Now, Michener's narrative opened, black, opened the black boxes of concepts such as domestication, while effectively shifting back between past and present, and notably uh, introducing narratives of different scales and dialogues between excavators. This is something that closely resembles, but significantly predates others, manifest for a new type of site report as a complex interweaving of sequences of events in the past, what happened on the site, and sequences of events in the present, what happened on the excavation. Now, what about archaeology? What can archaeology and material culture give? Well, first, uh, it can give meanings that change over time, uh, and then can be maintained or changed depending on the context in which they are inserted. This is something that material culture retains, and as such, books do too. But so this isn't the more important thing. What else can we give? Archaeology helps us reframe the information obtained from literature. And this is important, and I will explain why. Uh, but it, it also helps us make a distinction between the author's cognitive world uh, and the real world. So to understand why this is important, uh, we need to pass on to, sorry, to world building and the literary phenomena. Now, there are certain authors such as Eagleton and Wolfgang Gizet, who believe that the opposition between fiction and reality isn't enough. It is inefficient in explaining the literary phenomena. So what do they propose instead? The real, the fictive, and the imaginary. So what is this? Well, the real is the empirical extra-textual world. It serves as reference for writing. 
Then we have the fitting, which is uh, an input. An, what's the word? An intentional. Which is an intentional act. <laughs> so sorry. Which is an intentional act that corresponds to the non real that is creatively constructed. So it is the world that is created by the author. And then you have the imaginary, which is a bit only a little bit more complex, but it has to do with how the fictive appears in our imagination. So, uh, the imaginary is initially constructed through the so-called act of fictional life. It is because of this that even when elements are from reality, they are never a mere repetition of them. This happens because this act of pretending means that elements are taken away from reality, uh, and then they start to serve a new reality and a new purpose, so they lose all their semantic and structural determination. So, what happens then? Uh, upon the act of fictionalizing, there is a new referent that is given by the author that leads the once undefined form to a certain configuration, making the image constructed more specific in our minds. So, this means that the, the author makes two transgressions of limits. The first one is the indetermination of reality. And the second one is the determination of the imaginary. Now, examples. <laughs> so this becomes a little bit more clear. So, the fictive character uh, Severus Snape from Andy Potter was based on J.K. Rowling's real chemistry teacher, John Nettleship, and he was then imagined differently by different readers. And he appeared uh, in, the, in the movies being portrayed by Alan Rickman. So the producer imagined him as being portrayed by Alan Rickman. This also happens with places. We have Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Uh, now Tolkien took inspiration for the Old Forest from Mosley Book, just behind his house. And this was then represented in the, in the movies. But different people have different imaginaries, they imagine different forests. Now, if what makes a text fictive is the fact that elements, even if taken away from reality, uh, are never a mere repetition of that because they lose their primary context, then archaeology has a possibility of giving that, con that, that context. It has a possibility of uncovering that primary context. And this is why it is so important that archaeology help us referring the information given by literature. Now, I believe that meaning is something that emerges through the relationships between two things. What does this mean? Well, meaning isn't intrinsic to materiality. So, I have a boat. A boat isn't intrinsically a means of transportation. It can be a house, it can be a funeral element even be a bookstore. But meaning isn't fully discursive either. So I might want a boat to fly, but if materiality doesn't allow it, forget it. It won't, it won't happen. <coughs> of course, I can imagine a flying boat, but even that uh, comes for two, from two real things, a boat and wings. And this is why I think literary worlds are of particular interest. I think they are the conjunction between our material world and the cognitive world of the author. And of course, we already know some of these worlds from other sources and approaches, and we will never be able to access it all. But I believe that the literature can give us information previously unknown. Uh, and we, as archaeologists, have a privileged position that allows us to separate these two spheres. Now, there is also world building that occurs outside of literary worlds. So, readers have an hermeneutic world building. They add places, they add pieces to what they already know, evaluating them accordingly and then the whole world according to those pieces. And they also create a world in their minds through cognitive processes. Then we have critics. They have a moralistic perspective that is marked by their critical interpretations and theoretical filters at play. Um, and they, so they create a world, construct a world, in a wider context. But these critics and readers, they are also tourists. And this creates another type of literary landscapes, one that exists in the intelligible world. Now, when we talk about landscapes, we are necessarily talking about relations, relational ontology, and construction. Construction. In these literary landscapes, tourists see through, the, through an emotional and, men and mental trick of the eye. This is what allows them to enter what Edward Sorge calls the third scape, that it's simultaneously real, imagined, and more. So they are seeing a space that isn't clearly there. Now, part of the history of archaeology as a discipline, is tied to dis distinguishing ourselves from fiction, folklore, antiquarianism, etc., and aligning ourselves with the 
scientific developments. They are theologians as a scientist, fiction as a threat. Now, but does it matter if something is imaginary? Does it lose its value or does it gain a new one? Uh, our connection with the world around us is imaginary. It is based on a sense of empathy and on the, on the power of imagination. Meaning isn't there, it is made, it is constructed. I give you the example of Stonehenge. Stonehenge uh, is a prehistoric monument, not a druid one, but druids have a relation with Stonehenge, and that relation is real. Even if Stonehenge was never a druid, um, a druid monument. So, does it happen more to know? Uh, does it happen more? Uh, do we need more to know how the world actually was, or how it was perceived and felt? Maybe both. And if something mattered in the past, who are we, as archaeologists, to downgrade that meaning? Literary worlds affect people, even if they aren't real, maybe because they aren't real. And I give you an example, and I have to thank you, to thank my my friend Juan for this. <laughs> he was the one that sent the kiss. And the example is James Beerbohm's Enoch Swamis. Now, this is a story that has the particularity of addressing it, the existence and fictionality of its character. In it, a man named Enoch Swamis makes a with the devil and travels a hundred years into the future to see if uh, he has the fame and recognition he fixes his own for his poetry. What he finds out, however, is that people from the future think he's only a character created by Max Beerbohm's. And then the world, the, this world is full of characters that have real life real life reference. So this um, allows the truthful status of these characters and events. Now this ontological confusion is taken a step further when the actual painter, William Rottenstein, paints the portrait of Enoch Swami. Now the story this story is fiction, of course, but it had a real impact on readers. And on the third of June of nineteen ninety seven, several people went to the reading room of the British Museum to see if Enoch Swamis appeared. He didn't appear of course of course but it was this trip that made him real. These entities are real because of the concrete acts of the readers. This is what make, makes them real. Now, literature, as Mike Crane points out, is a process of signification, of making things meaningful in a social medium. So when we have these more than literary worlds, we just should see them as another aspect of our world and also as a starting point of research into meaning. Now, the story that the writer tells, it's fiction. The story that the writer tells, it's made. And so is that of an archaeologist, although to a different extent. The, different is, the difference is that our subjectivities remain more hidden. And this means that a novel allows, allows readers to engage with past and places better. Now, let's take into account Richard Johnson's circuit of production and consumption. Uh, in this consumption, public and private um, influences lead to the creation of a cultural product, product that it is both distinct and somehow employs traits familiar to a broader culture. Now, this, this product will have different readings, and then these readings that are influenced by people's individual knowledge and cultural inputs will inform the production of a new, for, uh, of a new product or the, the alteration of the existing one. So, meaning changes at each step along the, the circuit. And so, uh, there are some books that also change to, to accommodate these changing values. And I give you the example of Arthur Clarke's Childhood Sand. This book was published, um, and then some political, political and economic things happened, and scientific developments happened, that led Clark to heavily revise and modernize his book in childhood sent a novel. And the same happened with Obit, that was initially published in 1937 and was intended as a children's book. So it was much more like art, but soon had to be uh, changed so that it can match the later novels. Now, this also happens with these literary landscapes in the intelligible world. And sometimes there is even a loss of literary meaning when a text becomes so well known that it stops being read. Or, or so convincing that it starts to be perceived as an historical fact. And this is what happened with Evangeline 
by Henry Longfellow. This was the cornerstone of Nova Scotia's early tourism. But by the mid of the 20th century, tourists didn't know about the poem and started to thought of the story as a, as a romantic story from a, from a distant past. So, to end finale. <laughs> How do all these things come together? So, I think that the first step is that there is a moment of production in which the text is made in private and it is something concrete but also particular. For this moment of production, the material world and the cognitive world of the author, marked by his individual and, uh, and group identities, come together. And although drawing from something real, they create something fictive, through an indetermination of reality. The result is a text that takes the form of a book. Now once published, the novel then uh, goes public and is something more abstract but also more general. Then people read it, and by reading it and incorporating it to their private lives, the, the novel returns to the private sphere. But different people will have different readings and different interpretations. This will lead to different imaginary worlds, the interpretation of the imaginary. Now, these different readings will then, through lived cultures and social relations, lead to the creation of new social products. And these social products can be material ones. So, these literary worlds create materialities. Books are artifacts, and so are the material culture that is associated with them, created purposefully for them. Then we have sites that are related to their consumption and creation. And then we also have everything that is associated with creating these worlds in real life. Uh, merchandising, cosplay, museums, tours, embodying characters, uh, Recreating landscapes and scenes from from books and even movies. So this creates materiality. So to conclude, I think that more than questioning about what is archaeological, what is real, what is imaginary, what is material, it isn't material, does it count? Do we need to study this? I've, and more than limiting ourselves to measurable and positivist approaches, we should not deny. Uh, we should not deny the value of these contributions, nor the effect that they have on real life, because they have effect on people, on cultures, and on the intelligible world.